Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Ihab al-Hafni. I'm a professor of cardiovascular medicine at Al-Azhar University. I was the head uh, of the department of cardiovascular medicine in, Car in Al-Azhar University. And currently, I'm the head of the hypertension working group of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. The subject we are going to discuss today is the debates in hypertension, diagnosis, and management. As we can see here, we have a presentation that shows to you the pattern of blood pressure change during the day. It's recorded by the ambulatory blood pressure. In fact, what happens is that the blood pressure, it goes up in the early morning after dawn and the early morning. And that's why we find that most of the cases of myocardial infarction or cerebral strokes, it happens early in the morning. And then it goes down through the day, a little bit up during sunset, and then it goes down during sleep and to start rising up again in the next morning. One of the most common causes of death is high blood pressure. And if we can look at this slide, we'll find that the most common affection is in the middle uh, income countries rather than the high income countries or the low income countries. This is slide, it's, it's been done a long time ago in 2005. But it goes what, with what we are seeing now. In the year of 2000s, it was found that 26.4% of people are affected with hypertension. And the point is most of these people are in the established market economies, North America and Europe. It was expected at that time that by the year of 2025, the number will increase to 29.2%. But the distribution is different. It will be in the economically developing countries. It means Asia and Africa. Egypt is one of the countries that shows a moderate increase in the blood pressure as we can see from this one. When we look for any hypertension population in any country, we'll find the figures are almost the same. We'll find that the number of treated patients compared to the number of untreated patients, compared to the number of resistant hypertensions or unknown patient with hypertension is almost, the distribution is always almost the same. We'll find that as we can see here, the number of untreated hypertensive patient, it goes up to 33.5%. Controlled hypertension is about 10.4%. Uncontrolled hypertension without criteria of resistant hypertension it's 38.7%, while resistant hypertension makes a 17.4%. Same impression will come from this Johannes Stein study that published in 2010 in the United States. They have hypertensive patient of about 30.4% of the population, of which 46.5 are controlled, 53.5 are uncontrolled. And these uncontrolled patients were classified into three groups. Those uncontrolled, and they are aware and treated, they are 44.48%. Those are who are uncontrolled and untreated, but aware, and they comprise about 15.8%, while 39.54%, they are unaware that they have the disease. In fact, when we talk about being unaware of having a disease, it's because sometimes hypertension is just asymptomatic. And in fact, I consider that this is the bad point when you are asymptomatic, your blood pressure can goes up, you feel nothing. The headache or the pain in the back of the neck or something, this is the bell that rings you to take an action. Whenever you have no symptoms, you'll take no action, your blood pressure goes high and maybe the first presentation will be a presentation with a complication or an affection with target organ damage, as we can see here. The end organ damage caused by market elevation or uncontrolled of hypertension, it may affect the heart, leading to left ventricular hypertrophy, congestive heart failure, a coronary artery disease, it may affect the kidney, causing renal failure, proteinuria, the peripheral vascular disease, or it causes retinopathy, or it may cause which is common a stroke or cerebrovascular accident like hemorrhage or stroke. The first step to treat hypertension or for evaluation of a hypertensive patient, of course, 
is to measure the blood pressure. And in fact, this is the crucial point in the whole story, how to measure an accurate blood pressure. Because measuring the blood pressure is the cornerstone of the diagnosis. When you have the diagnosis, you can build up the treatment of the plan of treatment. Measurement of blood pressure requires what? Requires, number one, the cuff. You apply the cuff around the arm of the patient. You have to get the proper cuff. Because if you, if you use a small cuff, that will overestimate the blood pressure. If you use a large cuff, that will underestimate the blood pressure. So having different sizes of cuffs in your blood pressure, in your clinic, in the blood pressure machine, it's not uh, an option. It's a mandatory. In our country, we have an obese ladies, and these obese ladies, if you use with them the regular cuff, you are causing overestimation of your blood pressure. So you have a different sizes that accommodates with the different size of the forearm of the arm of the uh, your patients. For getting an accurate blood pressure reading, you need to use a good blood pressure machine. And these blood pressure machines, either the sphygmometer and the stethoscope, and this sphygmometer, it should be in fact calibrated from time to time to make sure that the reading is right. And the listening to the Krotokoff sounds or the sounds on the uh, on the forearm just to hear the sound of the systolic blood pressure and the systolic blood pressure, it may need some training. Different types of machines now are available, the automatic machines that applies for the forehand or uh, the types which are applied to the arm, which is basically more accurate than the smaller types. They are friendly used, used by the patients, used in medical centers and some of the hospitals. And other types of machines, as we can see, the oscillating type, which is not confidently uh, convincing after a long time or repeated time of use due to a weakness of its spring. So whatever the machine you are going to use, you have rules to get a, a right blood pressure reading. It requires that the patient is sitting. It's not lying down. He's not standing. In the classic way, he should be sitting for five minutes before measuring his blood pressure. His back is supported, his legs are uh, feeling the earth, the uh, land, and he, his arm is in the level of the heart. And he shouldn't be talking. You are a nice guy and the patient is sitting in front of you and you are talking with him to relax him. Yeah, that can happen before measuring the blood pressure, not during the active, the active uh, measurement process. So as you see, patient, he's not urgent to go to the bathroom. He's not smoking coffee. He's not, not smoking. He's not taking coffee before measuring the blood pressure. As we said, he's sitting down, relaxed, proper blood pressure cuff according to the size of his arm. And one of the big mistakes is measuring the blood pressure on clothes especially in the winter. In the winter, you will find that patients are coming to you, especially the old ladies, they are coming to you. They have many layers of cloth over each other. And then they are, they cannot stretch it because when they bring their cloth up, they cannot get it really to free their forearm to apply your cuff. So you take it easy, okay, it's fine. And I will apply the cuff over the cloth. This is wrong because this is makes the estimation or your blood pressure estimation is not accurate. So what we have to do is just to get the arm out, ask the lady nicely to get her arm out of her cloth, take rest covered properly for her to be uh, comfortable, and then get your blood pressure reading. While deflating the sphygmomanometer, it should be slowly two to three uh, millimeter mercury per second, as we know. Another type of measuring the blood pressure is the ambulatory blood pressure monitor. The ambulatory blood pressure monitor was, was introduced to solve some of the problems. We know many people come to you in the clinic. They sit down, I have a high blood pressure, I measure it from time to time, my blood pressure is really high, and they are very anxious. Then you measure the blood pressure. You get 170 over 90, 170, 80 for over 95. And you give medicine, and the patient goes out and while going home, they pass with the nearest pharmacy to their, the, to their house. 
and the patient calls you in the follow-up visit. Doctor, when I went home, I got to the pharmacy. Your blood, my blood pressure here in the clinic was 170. But when I measured it at the pharmacy, it was only 140, 130. And the doctor said to me, why are you talking the medicine? Your blood pressure is okay. This is the white coat syndrome. White coat syndrome is the elevation of the blood pressure in the medical facility that decreases after leaving the place. All of us know about that. The opposite is there, less common, the masked hypertension. Masked hypertension is the blood pressure is high at the medical, it's high at home and low at the medical facility. Other types is the episodic hypertension. The blood pressure, it goes up, the patient feels something abnormal. She tells you, I've got the blood pressure, it's 190 over 100 at home. When you measure it in the clinic, it's 120 over 95 or 85 or 75. In fact, and you have, in fact, when you have this situation, you have to think about many things. The first, is her blood pressure machine she used at home is accurate? If the somebody who's measuring her blood pressure at home, he knows what he's doing? If that pressure reading, blood pressure reading at home was accurate, that was very high, whatever the situation. So in such a case, we use the ambulatory blood pressure. This is episodic hypertension. Of course, we have an episodic hypertension like the Crohn's septum. Autonomic dysfunction, decrease with the blood pressure, patient get, getting dizzy, especially young ladies, teen, teenagers. We found that the, she, she's standing at the row of, uh, at, at the college or at school and suddenly she fell down or she get dizzy or drowsy. Nocturnal blood pressure dipping, which you cannot diagnose at the uh, office uh, measurement. So you have, got, have to have something to measure it at home or elevation of nocturnal blood pressure. All these problems were there. Most of them were not diagnosed by the clinic blood pressure estimation. And the uh, solution, and the solution for that was the use of the ambulatory blood pressure. One of the most important steps in the diagnosis and management of blood pressure, in my opinion, is the home blood pressure measurement. Why? The home blood pressure measurement is the key for diagnosis and follow-up. Ambulatory blood pressure, you send the patients or you apply an ambulatory machine for the blood pressure for 24 hours. The blood pressure becomes inflated every 15 to 30 minutes during night time, and the patient gets offended by the, by, by the expansion of the cuff while he's asleep. He finds his cuff is expanding and compressing his arms so he gets uh, irritated. But home blood pressure measurement, it's repeatable. You can use your blood pressure, you can use it at home. You can measure your blood pressure twice a day, three times a day, every day, as you wish. This is not applicable with the ambulatory blood pressure. So home blood pressure measurement is an easy way for actual and repeated blood pressure in patients with intermittent elevation of blood pressure. My blood pressure is getting up and then it goes down to normal back. This is the time when you feel you are unwell, just check your blood pressure and write it down and bring it to me when you come to the clinic. White coat syndrome is the same, masked hypertension is the same. The most important point in using the home blood pressures for monitoring of this patient is how is the patient measuring his blood pressure. So, I'll tell you what, whenever you have a patient and you have decided to depend on home blood pressure measurement, you have to teach the patient or first to test him. You test your patient, yes. Whenever I have a patient and this patient is measuring his blood pressure at home and he says to me, I got my blood pressure and it's like that, simply I tell him, please, Bring, bring your blood pressure machine and come to me next time. The patient brings his blood pressure machine. In fact, I don't use it. I tell him, sitting in my clinic, please measure your blood pressure. You want to know if that patient really knows how to measure his blood pressure? Is he applying the cuff in the, the, the normal way? Is he putting the cyst scope in the right position? 
or is he putting the sensor of the cuff of the automatic machines in the proper time, uh, proper point? And then how is he measuring his blood pressure? This is the point just to make sure or to have the confidence of the readings he will bring to you in the follow-up, especially when you give him a medicine and he's taking his medications following his blood pressure. If the medicine or the blood pressure readings you received are accurate, so you are sure that they are accurate because you are sure that this patient can measure his blood pressure correctly. As long as we have different methods of measuring the blood pressure, so the target was found to be different because the circumstances under which you measure your blood pressure are different. And that's why when you look to the office blood pressure, we found that the average of 140 over 90 is the maximum normal. While using the ambulatory blood pressure, it has a normal for daytime, a normal for nighttime, and a mean. At the daytime, you have a normal below than 135 over 85. The normal during nighttime is more uh, less than 120 over 70, while the mean blood pressure by ambulatory blood pressure, it was found to be below 130 over 80. Home blood pressure is different. It should be below 135, below 85 to consider it normal. Blood pressure goal in different guidelines, GNC7, GNC8, American European Society of Hypertension, Society of Cardiology, all of them, they are goals between 140 over 90 to 150 over 80 or 150 over 90 according to the age of the patients, especially those above 80 years. In diabetics, it may go down to 130 over 80 and the chronic kidney disease is the same. So. What really happens that, what's the impact? Well, why do we treat the blood pressure? Because we said it's a risk is something. Even comparing a high normal to normal to optimal, we'll find that the cumulative incidence percentage decrease or differs from a patient with normal blood pressure, from those to high normal or to the uh, subnormal. You have to know that the risk of blood pressure, it does not only depends on the systolic, but it depends also on the increase of the diastolic blood pressure. Cardiovascular mortality increases with the increase in the blood pressure, and we found that it doubles, in fact, with a 20 millimeter mercury increase in the systolic blood pressure or a 10 millimeter increase in the diastolic blood pressure. The reduction of the blood pressure is very important in reducing the risk for patients. We'll find that even the reduction of the diastolic blood pressure only, as we can see here, Change in the diastolic blood pressure for 70.5 millimeters to 2 millimeters to 5.6 millimeter will decrease the incidence of coronary heart disease and stroke by a measurable effect. Blood pressure reduction 2 millimeters will decrease the risk of cardiovascular events by 7 to 10 percent. The long term modest reduction, this is a very important slide. If you have 10 percent reduction in the blood pressure, and you achieved a 10% reduction in total cholesterol in addition, of course, affecting mainly the LDL, you'll achieve a 45% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Blood pressure goals in hypertensive patients, according to the, according to the guidelines, we'll, we'll find that the systolic blood pressure less than 140 millimeter mercury is recommended, recommended for all patients at low moderate cardiovascular risk. <clears throat> class 1 level of confidence B, and it's recommended in patients with diabetes, class 1 level of confidence A, and the diastolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeter mercury is always recommended. Less than 85, 85 millimeter mercury are recommended as well in patients with diabetes. While we have to consider a diastolic blood pressure between 80 and 85 is safe and well tolerated. What options of treatment do we have? The problem with hypertension, hypertension very uncommon to be alone, very uncommon to be an isolated disease. It can be, but it's not common. So it's usually combined with other morbid conditions. Hypertension is combined with renal disease, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, congestive heart failure. And that's why we'll find that the, that will play a very important role in selecting the medicine you are using. Don't forget that history of the patient is very important. What other medication is he taking? Is he taking oral contraceptive pills, diet pills, nasal decongestant all the time he keeps the box in his, in his bucket, 
and every five minutes he's just flush his nose with a decongestant that causes basic constrictions. Stimulant drugs, they like amphetamines, cocaine, and such stuff. Licorice, Ramadan, very nice, very cooling effect of licorice of, uh, syrup or liquid juice, but licorice increases the blood pressures. Immunosuppressive medications, other medications like VEGF inhibitors or other drugs and substance that may raise the blood pressure like anabolic steroids. Our guys who are playing in the gym, taking steroids to increase their muscle bulk or patients with a collagen disease who are receiving or asthmatic patients receiving steroids all the time and their blood pressure becomes elevated. All this stuff, you have to know it from a proper history taking from your patients. Two important medications are now in action with our, with our antihypertensive patients. The first one of them is phosphodiesterase inhibitor like sildenafil. In fact, many patients are using sildenafil, whether they tell you or not. And in fact, I encourage you to open the door for your patient to talk. Is he taking this or not? Because many people are ashamed to say that. Many patients, they don't like to discuss the matter in front of their wives accompanying them in your clinic. So take the time and take the opportunity just to discuss with your patient such uh, medications. The importance of this is, number one, is he gonna use the long acting type or the short acting type? The second thing, what's, how to identify and how to just plan the use of such medication in associations with your antihypertensive medicine. And that's why I advise you to use the short acting ones because that will give you the time that he takes the medicine, three, four hours it's off, so you can give him or plan for him your antihypertensive treatment for the second morning freely. The second medicine is this SGLT2 inhibitor, an anti-hyperglycemic medicine, an effective one, in fact, it has an impact on the cardiovascular risk. The point is it causes a lot of diarrhea, especially when it's recently used, and that will get out a large volume of fluid from your patient's body. And that's why the point is, consider the using of diuresis, decree the diuretics when the patient is using this for a short time. Number two, be careful because this medicine will cause some sort of reduction in his blood pressure. So just plan your antihypertensive uh, therapy uh, cautiously. Any antihypertensive therapy, it should lower your blood pressure effectively, it has a favorable safety profile, and it reduces cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Another important problem to evaluate in your patients during your clinical evaluation is the heart rate of your patients, because heart rate may define the medicine you are planning to give him. For instance, if you have a patient with a low heart rate, you shouldn't give him a beer blocker or something like this. A patient with a high heart rate, like the patients with high adrenaline or anxious patients, something like a beta blocker will be an efficient medicine for him and it will uh, be, be very suitable for him. So it's one of the points just to be evaluated during evaluation or clinical elevation. Consider that because the heart rate or the increase in the heart rate is usually associated with increase in the cardiovascular events, whether in the patient of coronary artery disease and hypertension. Starting min treatment of hypertension, we start with the non-pharmacological measures that will be applied to all patients. The diet control is the first. In fact, the diet, it goes, it has a priority for the exercise. And when we talk about the exercise, we are talking about a dynamic exercise rather than a static exercise. Lifting heavy weights is not an exercise that will decrease the blood pressure. Oppositely, it will increase it but we are talking about dynamic exercise, walking, jogging, swimming. That is the, the, the exercise we are talking about. When we talk about weight reduction, when we talk about uh, just uh, quit smoking or quit uh, alcohol intake, this is important, but this will help the blood pressure to be reduced over time. I believe the shortest cut to decrease your blood pressure from a non-pharmacological point of view is the salt restriction. And when you talk about salt to your patient, talk to him as you are living with him at home. Talk to him about what to eat, not to what, and which cannot be eaten. 
If he likes something, how can he salt his food if he's uh, a salty lover? Is he going to uh, buy the potassium salt? Is he, go, is, he, is he going to use vinegar, and use the lemon juice, whatever the situation. Discuss with your patient, solve his problems, so can he will obey your orders. So this is about the food. And the salt restriction, in fact, it is very effective in giving you some reduction in the blood pressure. When we go to the medications, we are talking about an antihypertensive therapy that should lower the blood pressure effectively, it should be safe, it will, should be reducing morbidity and mortality. Different groups or the groups known to all of us are the diuretics, AC inhibitor ARPs, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, alpha blockers, and mineralocorticoid antagonists, or a combination of, in, of any. Let's go very fast to do, through these groups we have with the start with the diuretic and we'll find that the diuretics they have no effect on the lipid profile but they show an evidence of a primary prevention beta blockers they decrease of course the blood pressure and the mean blood pressure they have no effect on the lipid profile they increase a little bit the insulin resistance and there is an evidence that they decrease the secondary prevention calcium channel blocker of course they are lowering the uh, the uh, blood pressure, they have neutral level on the lipid profile, they have uh, an evidence on primary and secondary prevention in non-dihydropyridine group only. ACEs, they have decreased the blood pressures, insulin resistance is decreased, no effect on the lipid profile, there is an evidence on their effect on the primary prevention as well as on second prevention. This is the summary of the groups we were talking about. So. When we select what medicine to give, deal with the patient as an entity. This patient, Mr. S, he has this years of age, he is a smoker or not smoker, he's obese or lean, he's half a family history or not, is he diabetic? Is he having a, a cerebrovascular disease, a peripheral arterial disease? What's his heart rate? What's his condition? Is he athletic? What's the situation? This is the patient you are talking about. Just tailor your medication according to the given information by your patient. For heart failure, you may use diuretics, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, uh, aldosterone antagonists. The postmyocardial infarction, you will be using AC inhibitors and beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists. For high cardio coronary risk, uh, coronary risk disease, you have used a diuretic, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, and calcium channel blocker. For patients with diabetes, ACEs, ARPs, maybe a beta blocker, diuretic, or calcium channel blocker. Patient with coronary kidney disease, ACEs or ARPs, it depends according to the uh, renal function. Recurrent stroke is, will benefit from the diuretic and from ACE inhibitor. Choices of drugs, as we see, in heart failure, in post-myocardial infarction, beta blocker, ACEs, ARPs, aldosterone antagonists, high cardiovascular disease, ARPs, thiazides, diuretics, beta blocker, ACEs, calcium channel blockers, in diabetics, the ACEs and the ARPs and the calcium channel blockers, coronary kidney disease, ACEs, ARP, calcium channel blockers, recurrent stroke, ARPs, thiazides, AC inhibitors. However, sometimes your patient is not controlled with only one medicine, so you will shift it to a combination therapy. In fact, many studies, as you can see, they are supporting the use of one more than one medicine, two medications, and of course, the, poly, uh, the polybel uh, uh, technique is very important. Instead of giving multiple tablets per day, you are just given one tablet that contains the three medications or three materials you need to give your patients. How you have to remember something. Whenever the number of tablets the patient is taking per day are decreasing, the more compliance your patient is. One of the studies that was done a long time ago, it showed that every patient who is taking only one tablet per day for a week, he misses one tablet per week. So he's taking one tablet per day. In a week, he should take seven tablets in seven days. The studies show that these people are usually taking six tablets per week, so he's missing one tablet. 
if he's taking six tablets per, per day, you can think of how many tablets he's gonna miss. He, he may forget, he may take an overdose, especially old people living alone. The possible, co possible combinations of antihypertensive agents, we know this slide, it's a famous one. The angiotensin receptor blockers can be combined with calcium channel blockers or with diuretics, the three of them, or ACEs instead can be combined with them. Mira blockers, alpha blockers, everything can be combined except, of course, the undesirable combination between the angiotensin receptor blockers and the ACE inhibitors. And now let's go to the key points. First of all, the incidence of hypertension is high and increasing. The incidence of complication is directly proportional, either to the systolic or diastolic blood pressure. Each patient should be evaluated on an individual basis, considering his or her comorbidities. First step in the successful and safe treatment of hypertension is the proper diagnosis. The art of selecting the proper medication is what it's all about. Thank you very much.